Hey friend, thanks for clicking play on this first in the series, Christmas Oracles. We're going to find out how the Old Testament connects to the New Testament. And did you realize the Old Testament has a lot to say about Christmas? So this is a long form teaching series here on Growing in the Gospel. There are six parts to this series. This is part one, and I hope you will be blessed by today's message. So an oracle is a prophecy. It's a promise, okay? And so Christmas oracles are ancient promises that go way back. We're talking about thousands of years before the day in which we live. We're talking about today, 700 years before Jesus was ever born. The scripture that we just read and that we'll study in a moment uh, was given, pointing directly to Jesus. And I need to take some time to set up the historical adventure and the context that is before us. And so I, uh, I want to challenge you. Some years ago, when Larry was a little boy, he wanted to watch Lord of the Rings. Has anybody in the room just tried to sit down and watch Lord of the Rings? Wave at me. Okay, I didn't get it. Okay, I mean, it was like names and cities and people and kings, and I'm like, who's that guy? They all sound the same to me. And the hobbits, and what are they trying to do? And, and what, you know, the guy with the pointy ears, and everyone trying to kill everybody, and I just didn't get it. Their own language, their own, it was, their, it was this higher, entire world that Tolkien created. Well, the narrative of Scripture is a story. It's a redemptive historical narrative. Would you say those words with me? Redemptive historical narrative narrative. And what I had to do as I watched those Lord of the Ring movies, those complicated movies, I had to, kept having to pause it. And my 10-year-old son would say, no, no, that's the king of this city, and no, no, they're good. And he'd explain, I'm like, finally, I'm like, how do you know all this? Uncle Scott told me. Okay, so he had his own direction. Here's my point. I I, I could have plowed into it, it would have taken me a long time, but it was good to have a guide to walk me through Lord of the Rings and break it down. And once I understood the story, wow, what a great story. Uh, and what a creative mind that came up with it. Well, sometimes when you jump into the Bible, you can feel a little bit lost like I did with Lord of the Rings, okay? Uh, and you, you gotta, you, if you're not careful, you'll just approach it mystically and you'll just start fishing for one phrase, like you can pull out and make it mean whatever you want it to mean. And that's not how to use the Bible. Okay? The Bible is a redemptive historical narrative. There's many genres of scripture. There's historical narrative, there's poetry and psalms, there's wisdom literature, there's prophecy, there's apocalyptic predictions, uh, there's the gospels, the life of Jesus. So it's diverse in its style, but it traces one story all the way through, and it's God's story of redemption. And at the beginning of the Bible, you have the account of creation, God creating everything. It all belongs to him. And really later we find out that that was Jesus that did that creative work. And then you've got the Old Testament marching forward and things just get worse and worse and darker and darker. But everything that unfolds in the Old Testament keeps pointing to promises, predictions. And all the way through the, whole, the Old Testament, the voice of God is essentially saying, if I can radically simplify it, Things are gonna get worse and worse, but hope is on the way. I'm gonna provide salvation. Well, then you come to the centerpiece of the story, and that is Jesus. The arrival of Jesus, the God-man. God breaks into time and space and comes to planet Earth. And at the time of that account, you're not sure precisely what he came to do and how he's gonna do it. The Jews definitely didn't know why he came in, in particular. They, they had wrong ideas. Well, then from there, you have the New Testament unfolding, the life of Jesus and the life of the church. And so all of that flows out of Jesus. So the Bible can be summarized in, in this simple framework, like a funnel turned on its side, starting at creation and, and pointing to Jesus. And Jesus is the centerpiece of all of it. All the Old Testament leads up to him and points to him and is fulfilled in him. And then the funnel widens out from Jesus to, at the end of time, a new creation, a new kingdom, a new heaven and a new earth, new you in a new body, living forever and ever and ever with an eternal king. And that's what we celebrate at Christmas. Joy to the world. The Lord has come. Help me out. Let earth receive her king. 
But here's the deal. Uh, the prophecies that pointed to all this and then the way it unfolded isn't quite like you would have written the story or like I would have written the story. And so when we come to the story, we have to ask ourselves, who is God? How is he writing this story? And how do I understand this story? And how do I find myself in it? Where am I in the story? And how do I hold on to all the truth and all the hope and all the promise that it offers me? So as we come to Isaiah, we come to a very dark time. And these oracles, all these oracles are promises given in hopeless days, in dark days, in a dark world where things kept appearing to get more and more hopeless. But here's the beautiful part of what we're gonna study these coming weeks. We belong and we believe in a God who speaks. He speaks into darkness. In fact, Hebrews says that in times past, he spoke through prophets. But in these last days, that's today, and in the recent centuries, he has spoken unto us by his son, Jesus, and by the word of Jesus, and by the story of Jesus that's still unfolding in our lives today. And then Hebrews continues to describe Jesus as the son who is heir of all things, who made the worlds, who is the brightness of all of God's glory, and the express image of his person. So Jesus is all of God in a human body. And he, Jesus, is upholding to this day all things, the entire cosmos, by the word of his power, and that when he came by himself, he purged our sins, and then he sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Now, that's, that's, a, that's a big descriptor of Hebrews, talking about Jesus coming as God and then doing the work that he did and then reigning in heaven now, and we're waiting for him to finish the work. We're kind of stuck in the middle of waiting. This is why what we're gonna study is so pertinent to your life and my life. Like these oracles, these promises were given to people sitting in darkness, waiting in dark times. Do you ever feel like you're living in dark times? Am I the only one? Like, is it not getting darker and darker? Doesn't it feel like just looking at earthly situations that it's getting more hopeless, more convoluted, more confusing, more backward with every passing day. So what do we do with all this? Well, we go to God's word. God's word always gives us the answers and never did he give us any better answers than the answers that point to Christmas. So before we jump into Isaiah, I wanna set up for you the actual historical context of what we're gonna talk about. Remember this, kind of like the Lord of the Rings illustration, if you just drop into like the third book halfway through, you're gonna be like, what's going on? Who is this? Where are we at? What's a hobbit? Right? So if you just drop indiscriminately into Isaiah, if, uh, you gotta be careful how you approach the word of God. God's word, okay, Isaiah is a specific person. He's a prophet. He's a messenger. He was given a specific message at different times of his life to take to specific people who were facing very specific situations. And they were instructions in those situations and promises in those situations that would hold them together. So before we jump into Isaiah and just go fishing for a line that we understand and go, yay, it really actually fills in the gaps if we ask ourselves who's writing and to who and what was going on and what was God saying to them? Because it's through that lens that we can understand what God is saying to us today. If you don't approach the Bible that way, you can make it say whatever you want it to say. And that's called false teaching. That's called heresy, okay? So we always wanna study it contextually. Well, what is the context here? Isaiah is prophesying in a, in a bad time in Israel's history. Israel is a nation in the Middle East that God has raised up from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They've entered the promised land early in the Old Testament narrative. They conquered the land. They divided the land. Now they're dwelling in the land. And eventually they had a king, Saul. He wasn't that good. But then David. David came to the throne. David loved God. David elevated God, drew the people to worship God. And never in Israel's history was there a better time than the reign of David. David was an amazing king. He wasn't perfect. 
He was flawed, like all human beings are. But as far as the kingdom of Israel, that was the high point. Well, his son Solomon started off well, built the temple, was you know, lavish in his wealth and opulence, but then he became an idolater, a sex addict, and everything went bad, and he led the people astray. And it wasn't long before the nation that was once the people of God uh, reflecting the glory of God and the truth of God to the whole world, they became a people that were idolatrous, that had forsaken God. They were literally sacrificing, murdering their own children on idols, on, on, uh, on altars in Jerusalem to false, to pagan deities. They were completely dishonoring God. Well, God in mercy called them back to himself, but they wouldn't have it. They didn't want God. So God pronounced through these prophets some judgments, some outcomes that were gonna unfold negatively. The first was that the kingdom would be split. After Solomon, there would essentially be a civil war. Imagine if in the Civil War era, in the 1800s, America became two countries and stayed that way, okay? That's what happened in Israel. It became a northern kingdom of a a group of tribes, and it became the southern kingdom of predominantly the tribe that we call Judah. So a lot of times you read the word Judah in the Bible, it's talking about the southern half of the nation of Israel, where, where Jerusalem is and a little bit south of there. By the time Isaiah is writing, the northern kingdom has been eradicated. The Assyrian Empire has come from the northeast out by Iraq, and they've made their way down, conquering and pillaging as they go, until they've overrun Syria, Damascus, and then pushed right into the northern parts of Israel, overran all of the tribes of the nation of Israel. Now think about how how destitute this is. The entire northern half of the country invaded by their worst enemy, bloodshed, destruction, and enslavement. And suddenly this pristine people of God, this promised land, is now occupied by pagan, Satan-worshiping, demonic people that have trashed the whole land and overrun all of the northern parts of Israel. So hope is gone. Okay, bring it into the modern context. Imagine that uh, some northern or European countries or Russia invaded America through Canada and they pushed all the way to like the border of South Carolina and everything north of South Carolina was under siege and bloodshed and destruction but everything south of South Carolina, like if you get to Florida, you're safe. I mean, what chaos. That's what's happening. In, in, that's what's just happened in Isaiah's day. And the Assyrians have come right to the border of Judah. And they're threatening and demanding and threatening. And Judah is led at this time by a king named Ahaz. Ahaz has led the people away from God, far from God. He did terrible, terrible things. He has perverted the worship of God. He has, he has embraced every kind of pagan practice. And he's trying to strike diplom- diplomatic agreements with the Assyrians. He's trying to get help from other kingdoms around. But essentially Israel is surrounded in this moment by the Assyrians to the north, the Egyptians to the south, and the Babylonians to the east, and the Mediterranean Sea to the west. They are landlocked by the worst of the worst enemies. And now the northern Assyrians are coming right to their border. And Isaiah was sent by God into those circumstances to speak to these people. Now these people, there's two kinds of them. The bulk of them have turned away from God. They don't want him, they don't want his truth, they don't want his word, they want their own way. But then there are some, we call them a remnant. There are some that still love God. Imagine living in Israel at that time, seeing your whole nation destroyed, the great promised land being overrun, the great kingdom of David being trashed. And imagine you being a God-fearing lover, a follower, a disciple of God, seeing all that happening around you, how hopeless and despairing you would feel. So Isaiah is warning those that have rejected God, and he's gonna speak hope to those who haven't rejected God. I don't know which one you are. You're at church, so I assume maybe you might not be a God rejecter, but maybe somebody made you come today. Um, So you could be either one. But we're gonna find out that this text and these promises and this truth, this word that God reveals still speaks to us today. And one of the big takeaways is that 
and it's the takeaway of Christmas. No matter how bad things become, there is always hope when you're a follower of God. No matter how bad things become, there is always hope if you're a follower of God. This portion of Isaiah's prophecy, and there's 64 chapters of it, but the portion we're going to look at today specifically points to God's promise in Jesus. Specifically points to the first Christmas morning, and it reveals really three big realities that bring forward to our day, that apply to our lives and your life tomorrow and all this week in the context in which we live, because we live in a dark day. We're waiting for God to finish the work that he promised to do. We're waiting for God to fulfill the promises he's given to us. And the question that haunts you and haunts me, is God going to be good to his word? And what these oracles give us is a God of credibility. A God who 700 years before Jesus ever showed up said, here's what I'm going to do. Keep your eyes wide open. Wait for it. Hope for it. Let it hold you together because I will do this. Now, three thoughts I want to share with you out of this passage. Are you ready? All of that, we, st- we walked out to the edge of the diving board, and we're going to dive now. You ready? Can you swim? This is the deep end. We're going to dive. We're going to jump right in. Okay, number one, Jesus our light. Jesus our light reveals the truth of God. Jesus our light reveals the truth of God. Now, to To get this, we're going to have to go back a little bit before chapter 9 into chapter 8, okay? Chapter 8 is is wonderful and profound and beautiful. I wish I could read the whole thing to you. We're going to pick it up in verse 16. Isaiah, by God's direction, says, Bind up the testimony, that's the word of God. Seal the law, same concept, the word of God, Among my disciples, that's those people, that remnant that still loved and still wanted to follow God. Verse 17 is Isaiah's resolve. I will wait upon the Lord that hideth his face from the house of Jacob. House of Jacob is just a reference to Judah, the the Israelites, okay? He says, I'm going to wait on God even though he seems to have turned his back. I will look for him. Even in this dark day, I'm going to look for him. I'm not giving up hope. I'm not letting go. I still believe God's going to come through. Verse 18, behold, I and the children the Lord hath given me are for signs and wonders in Israel from the Lord of hosts. He's just saying God sent me as a messenger. He's going to give you some signs through me for you to hold on to for hundreds of years. Which dwelleth in Mount Zion. That's another word for for, for Jerusalem. Verse 19, and when they shall say, they is the people that have turned away from God. You'll catch that in a second. These people are saying, look what they're saying. Seek unto them that have familiar spirits and unto wizards that peep and that mutter. These people, in turning away from God, were desperately longing for answers. They're desperate people in desperate times, desperately longing and looking for answers, but they're looking in all the wrong places. Who are they seeking to Who are they going to, turning to, for answers? They're seeking to familiar spirits, wizards. It's mysticism. It's spiritism. It's demonism. It's mediums. It's deception and delusion. They're turning to fortune cookies and magic eight balls and Ouija boards and tarot cards and palm readers and crystal balls. Does it sound like 2021? Hey, last week, I met a lady that she said, I'm a medium. I've met many people in New England. Hey, this is not ancient Israel we're talking about. This is 21st century New England. I'm talking about educated, master's degree. You know, I mean, these are people way beyond the intellectual spectrum, and they talk to spirits. And they're looking for answers. Because all the education and all the knowledge and all the secular theories and ideas and science itself does not fulfill the cravings and the deepest answers of the human heart. And so the postmodern world that's been told everything is natural, the heart is yearning and craving. And that heart that's rejected God is still out there plundering and looking for answers and trying every kind of mystical and spiritual option. And it's all lies and deception. Well, what happens when these people are looking for truth, but they're looking in darkness for truth? They're looking in darkness for light. 
Look at what he says. Should not a people seek unto their God? This is what's remarkable about this passage. God, the whole while, is standing there to these people that have turned away from him, and he's saying, if you ask me, I'll give you answers. If you'll accept my truth and my reality, if you'll look to me, I'll point you. I'll never lie to you. I'll never deceive you. Come back to me, God's saying. Should not a people seek unto their God? The living to the dead? Why would living people go to talk to dead spirits and dead ghosts and think that could bring them hope and help in this life? Doesn't make sense. It's irrational when you have a good God with a great word of truth ready to help you shape your life. So verse 20, Isaiah says, to the law and to the testimony. What is he saying? Exactly what you're doing this morning. He's saying, go to God's word. Build your life on God's testimony. Build your life on a biblical worldview. If you wanna get out of darkness and into light, if you wanna get out of deception and into truth, then go to God's word, go to God's record. And then he says this, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. What, what happens to the people that reject light, reject truth, and wander in darkness talking to spirits and mystics? Here's what happens. Look at verse 21. They shall pass through it, through life, through the land, through the circumstances they're in, the destitution. Hardly be stead. That means severe weariness. They'll be emaciated. They'll be weary and hungry, famished, starving. And it shall come to pass that when they shall be hungry, they shall fret or fear themselves. And look what they do next. They curse their king and their God, and they look upward. They, they shake their fists in God's face. Does this not sound like 2021? I've never heard anybody curse with the name of Adolf Hitler. Like they hit their thumb with a hammer and they go, Adolf Hitler, that hurts. Ow. No, they say Jesus Christ. They say God and then they fill it in. See, we live in a world who is so st steeped in darkness and so swallowing deception that they need to curse, frankly. They're miserable. And when they decide to curse someone or something, they want to curse God. They want to curse Jesus. And that's exactly what God said 2,700 years ago that people in darkness would do, is they would go deeper into darkness and their hungry souls would be so hungry and so destitute they would curse God as though it is his fault. Look at verse 22. They shall look unto the earth. They're looking to earthly solutions and man-made systems. And behold, trouble and darkness, dimness of anguish, and they shall be driven to darkness. You know what God is saying? As long as man doesn't want me, he's destined to darkness and self-destruction. God's saying, as long as you don't want me, earth, as long as you don't want me, mankind, you are destined to tear down one system, one broken system, and replace it with another equally broken system. And you will replace that with another broken system. And you will continue to build broken systems and broken saviors. Think about this. Every four years, we are praying and hoping for another new savior in the election process. And every savior, four years later, has significantly let us down. I'm 52. I don't... I, can't do the math quickly to figure out how many elections I voted in, but no president has saved the world yet. And I've been told that all of them would. Every time I'm told they will always save the world. And if not the world, America at least. So, oh, oh well with the rest, at least I'll be okay. See, God has a much bigger heart. And all of our efforts to save ourselves and save what we love and save this world as it is will come to nothing but deeper and deeper darkness. Say, well, why did I come to church today? This is totally depressing. I'm just trying to help you see the word of God is incredibly relevant and accurate to the profile of today. If these words were credible then, how much more credibility do they have right now? Because this stuff is still unfolding all around us. But here's the good news. God is about to promise light into the darkness. He's about to explain 
the darkness is not permanent. The darkness is not forever. The darkness isn't going to win. Now, I don't know about you, but in winter, I get light obsessed. I mean, I like if there's a window in a restaurant, I'm gonna go sit next to the window. I try to get where the light is. If the sun is shining, I try to get in it through a window or in my car or somehow. I am light obsessed. How many of you are like me? You're light obsessed. You miss the longer days. Okay. Did you know some of you are depressed right now and you think the world's coming to an end and everything's bad and it's mainly for one reason. You're living in darkness because the sun comes up at 9 a.m. and it goes down at 10 (laughs) a.m. The sun is like, hi, bye, you know. And it doesn't do this, it does this. That's why it's always in your eyes at this time of year. No matter where you go, the sun's shining right in your eyes because it's just kind of barely peeking up around the horizon and it just goes, it feels like it's about an hour. Like you just got going in your day and it's dark already. Um, there are several articles I read this week about darkness, just to cheer you up even more. <laughs> hey, by the way, um, here's the good news. Just a week or two from now, December 22nd, that's your new day. That's when the days start getting longer. So hold on, the days are gonna get shorter a little bit more, and then we're cruising forward. They start to get longer. But uh, Smithsonian Magazine published an article in 2014 called The Danger of Winter Darkness, Weak Bones, Depression, Heart Trouble. We're all going to die. (laughs) Scientists are discovering that prolonged darkness can play a role in disorders from depression to diabetes. The consensus seems that sunlight is essential to human flourishing. Seasonal affective disorder, also known as SAD, is a subtype of depression that involves Many of the same symptoms, including loss of energy, lack of interest of enjoyable activities, oversleeping, and feelings of hopelessness. And in my life, addiction to sugar cookies. (laughs) Which makes it worse. The evidence is that we all need some rays of light to stay healthy. And thank the Lord, that will become incrementally easier after December the 21st. So, no, it's not all dark, though it feels like it is, spiritually and even physically. Jesus points us to truth. Truth is scripture. He's the light that reveals truth. But secondly, and track with me, he's the light that offers life and victory. Life and victory. So here's what happens when, when we turn to, through chapter eight, everything seems bad, chapter nine. Pick it up with me in verse one. Nevertheless, the dimness shall not be as was in her vexation. This is a time of dark. So the overrunning of the Assyrian army, okay? The dimness that is, is not going to continue perpetually. When at the first he lightly afflicted the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, hold those two lands, we're coming back, and afterward did more grievously afflict her by the way of the sea beyond Jordan in Galilee of the nations. Now in verse one, there's some geography, This is why I say we're deep diving. I'm gonna put a map up. We're gonna go to school for a minute. Hang with me, dial in. This is really big, okay? You have a great God who made great promises and you gotta connect the dots. So this is a map of the nation of Israel, okay? To the south, you've got Egypt. To the north, we've been overrun by Assyria. Assyrian army has come all the way down past the little Sea of Galilee, all the way down the Jordan River to where you see the line between Benjamin and Judah. They're right there on the border ready to invade Judah, threatening. Ahaz is making, trying to make an alliance with them. Egypt is to the south, their enemies. Babylon is gonna come from the east, their enemies. So Egypt, I'm mean, sorry, Israel is surrounded. In this passage, during this very dark and desolate time, everything north of the Judah line is occupied by enemies. It's as dark and bad as you could possibly imagine it. And God says, hey, the dimness isn't gonna be forever. The darkness isn't gonna last forever. I'm afflicting Zebulun and Naphtali. Well, I need you to mark this on the map. These are the tribes of Israel. They're like states. It's as if in modern vernacular, God said, I'm afflicting South Carolina and North Carolina. You know, I mean, they're, they're two regions of the nation. Well, these regions are up north by that little Sea of Galilee. You'll see a little section of land that says Zebulun, kind of in a crooked way. And then Naphtali kind of goes vertical up 
north. And you can, by the way, see the green color on the map because it's very fertile up there. It's very rural. It's still to this day countryside and farms, and it's beautiful. Okay, so Zebulun and Naphtali, at the, po- at the moment this is written, they're occupied by Assyrians. Bloodshed, Gentiles, God's great people and great nation have been overrun. It's terrible. God says, hey, the land of Zebulun and Naphtali are on my radar, and they're not always gonna be vexed. Now let me tell you about Zebulun. There's a, there's a city in Zebulun called Nazareth. Does anybody know why Nazareth is significant? Jesus of, oh, wait. This is why it's so great to have a 20, 2021 view of this. We get to look back over thousands of years and see did God keep his word? Because God in a minute is gonna say, the people that walked in darkness in Zebulun and Naphtali will see a great light. They're going to experience an explosion of light that's going to cause them to rejoice and celebrate like the greatest payday, the greatest lottery win, the greatest victory that anyone has ever imagined. These people are gonna celebrate that experience. But it's hard for these recipients to understand that because the Assyrians own that land now and all those people have been overrun and are dead and it's the land of the Gentiles now. It's not even the promised land anymore. But Jesus grew up in Nazareth. But it gets even better than that. The land just next to Zebulun is called the land of Naphtali. And you'll see that borders the Sea of Galilee. That's why this whole region is called Galilee, okay? The Sea of Galilee. And on the northern part of that sea, in the region of Naphtali, is a city called Capernaum. Capernaum is where Jesus lived his adult life and home-based his ministry for two years. Before he went to Jerusalem to die, he did all of his miracles and most of his work out of Capernaum. He called his disciples in Capernaum. He went back to Capernaum after the resurrection. Capernaum was home base. He even at the end of his ministry warned Capernaum for rejecting him and saying, if Sodom had seen all that you see and heard all that you hear, they would have believed and they would remain to this day. And he pronounced judgment on Capernaum for rejecting him, for not receiving him. Now, so 700 years prior, God says about Zebulun and Naphtali, look at verse two, the people that have walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shined. Look at verse three. Thou hast multiplied the nation and not increased the joy. For a long time, the nation multiplied no joy. Verse three, or I'm sorry, the the middle of verse three, there's a colon, and suddenly they're joyful. They joy before thee according to the joy in harvest. The biggest payday you would ever imagine in your life. How would it make you celebrate? They joy as a joy in harvest, or as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. Again, the best modern illustration I can think is if tomorrow you opened your mail and some anonymous person sent you a $10 million winning lottery ticket, oh, how would that change your How would it change your attitude? Probably the dark days wouldn't bother you so much all of a sudden because you could buy an island somewhere and a plane to fly you there. I mean, all of a sudden your whole life changes because of the events that shined into your life in this moment. So God describes what he's gonna do through Jesus, as a light breaking darkness in a way that breaks the deepest kind of darkness with the brightest kind of hope and the brightest kind of light and joy and rejoicing and celebration. By the way, this was fulfilled in Matthew 4 when it says Jesus went to Capernaum and did his ministry there, and specifically it quotes this verse from Isaiah. But look at verse 4. We see more about this victory that this light event is going to unfold. So in the first position, we know um, that it's gonna break up darkness and it's gonna bring great joy and a, and a huge payday, okay? Verse four, it's going to bring deliverance. Uh, it's gonna bring victory. For thou hast broken the yoke of his burden, that's Israel, and the staff of his shoulder and the rod of his oppressor. You've broken the enemies. 
as in the day of Midian. Now, here's what's significant about that phrase, the day of Midian. It's talking about Gideon's victory. And if you remember, that's in Judges. 300 men that didn't fight, they just broke pitchers and blew trumpets and shouted, overcame thousands and thousands of Midian enemies. And it was really God that fought for them. So the essence of this battle, the essence of this victory, is that whatever light event is going to break upon Zebulun and Naphtali is going to bring great light, great joy, great payday, but great victory, but a kind of victory that the people don't have to fight for. It's a grace victory. And we see it again in the next phrase. Look at it with me. For every battle of the warrior is with confused noise and garments rolled in blood. That's a, that's a picturesque way of saying battle is hard. And people, when they go to battle, it's confusing and it's exhausting. And you go and you, you get bloody. It's messy. And you have to fight for your survival and fight for your safety. But God says it's not going to be that way with this battle. He says, but this, this battle shall be with burning and fuel of fire. What's he referring to? All of the war equipment, the bows, the arrows, the spears, uh, the armor, the shields, the, the garments that they wore to battle, they're not gonna need it. They're gonna actually use it for firewood and for fuel, to fuel the fires. They're not gonna have to fight. And it's gonna be so sudden and so victorious and so liberating that they're gonna take the things that they thought kept them safe and they're gonna burn it for firewood. Imagine, <laughs> sorry my brain goes to these weird places. Imagine that, ladies, you came home from Costco one day with a car full of groceries and your, wife, your husband had, a, uh, had a, a, a skill saw and he was literally like chopping the house up into pieces and setting it on fire on a cold winter day in your front yard. Like entire sections of your house were being dismantled and your husband was burning it. First of all, you'd freak out and you would, he probably wouldn't live, but if you didn't kill him. Okay, the only reason, the only way that would be reasonable is if you had so much money and such access to so much greater housing that your present resource was only good for firewood. And if your husband says, no, no, we won the lottery, we have a billion dollars, and I bought five homes, and I was really cold, so I just wanted to burn this one. And if you knew how great the provision was, it wouldn't bother you that you were burning what you thought was so valuable. That's what's happening in this battle. They're burning their spears and their shields. They don't need them anymore because they didn't have to fight for the victory. The victory's already been fought and it's been won so conclusively, they'll never have to fight again. So God says this light event is going to bring great, great joy, great harvest, great payday, great deliverance, great life. Uh, it's going to bring great victory. Listen, this is a foreshadowing of the gospel. All this is pointing to Jesus. It's saying Jesus is gonna fight a battle you can't fight. And he's gonna win a victory so big that everything else you think is securing you and protecting you and keeping you safe is going to be counted as loss for what you gain in him. He's going to so fulfill you and so bless you. He's gonna give a kind of victory that's so conclusive and so comprehensive that it's going to solve all of your problems forever. Isaiah refers to this event also as God's servant. In chapter 42 and 53, he assigns three functions. And this is a little bit of a parenthesis, but hang with me, and I want you to write these down. The servant of God that accomplishes these events, he has three functions, okay? The first is to defeat evil and liberate its captives. Once and for all, final defeat. The second is to rule and bring final and ultimate judgment, to, to reckon all things, total justice. And the third is to suffer and offer a grace redemption or a sin atonement to any who would receive it. So think about this. This servant, this light that's gonna come to Zebulun and Naphtali is going to win a victory that defeats evil. He's going to bring judgment that reckons with all justice for all time, ultimately and once and for all, and 
before all that, he's going to suffer in a way that atones for the sins and gives a way of redemption for people that don't know God. So the question is, if, if this servant, if this light event is gonna destroy evil, if God is going to come and to destroy every bad thing, how many of us are gonna be left? Are you with me? If Jesus is gonna come and destroy every bad thing, wouldn't he have to destroy me too? Because there's plenty of bad in me, and there's plenty of bad in you. So it begs the question, okay, wait a minute. How is he gonna do this? How is he gonna defeat evil and not destroy me? Does he love me? It begs the question, by what act is God going to accomplish this ultimate victory and my ultimate salvation? And that brings us to the third thought. That is, Jesus, our light, gives perfect happiness and peace. Perfect happiness and peace. So here's the act. God says, yeah, I'm gonna bring judgment. Yes, I'm gonna reign. Yes, I'm going to defeat evil once and for all forever. But first, I'm gonna come as a baby. And I'm gonna suffer as a savior. First, here he says in verse six, for unto us, a child is born. God says, in order to save you, I can't come as a conquering king the first time. I have to come as a suffering sacrifice so I can deal with your sin, so I can redeem you if you want to be redeemed. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is, what's the word? Shout it out. Given. It's a gift. This again hints at the idea we don't fight for this. He did. It's grace. Salvation is grace. We don't achieve it or accomplish it like religion tells us we can. We don't uh, live up to it like philosophy and secular uh, education tells us we have to. No, we humble ourselves before God and we receive it as a gift. Jesus, God in the flesh, came as a child. And look how it describes him. It describes this child. This light event is a child. A son given and the government shall be upon his shoulder. What is he saying? That Jesus will ultimately take full responsibility, the ultimate burden for your safety, provision, and liberty. Imagine with me for a second, if you woke up tomorrow, turned on the news, and the headlines were, while you were sleeping, Jesus came back and brought world peace, and he's now in charge. I know that's not how it's gonna work, but what if that would happen? Like, how relieved would you be tomorrow? Oh, he's here? Boy, I'm gonna sleep good tomorrow. Finally. Because we know all of our efforts are not gonna result in saving the world, much less saving ourselves. Much less saving the world. Maybe I should reverse that. So ultimate government is gonna, he's gonna be in charge of everything. Look at what it says next. His name shall be called Wonderful. Now if I said to you, tomorrow a man is coming to the throne of the world He's gonna rule the world. You would immediately think oppression. You would immediately think dictator. And so God says, not, not a dictator. He's gonna be wonderful. You're gonna drop your jaw, and the more you know him, and the more you see how he loves and cares, you're gonna eyes wide with wonder your whole life. You're gonna be captivated by him. He is wonderful. Next, he is counselor. He is full of wisdom. He wants to advise you and teach you and instruct you and walk with you. He's not just gonna rule the world, he's gonna guide your life. And he is the mighty God. He is deity wrapped in humanity. He is God in a human body and he's the everlasting father. Now I don't know what kind of father you had. I don't know if you even know your father. Some of you had good dads, some of you had bad dads. Some of you have terrible experiences and just the mention of the word father tweaks you or triggers something. But can I tell you something? God is the perfect father your heart has always longed for. And he will forever be your everlasting father. The prince of peace, get this, this is big. It means he's the ultimate bringer of the ultimate kind of peace. He made peace, Peter said, or Colossians says, by the blood of his cross. So Jesus on the cross was achieving a kind of peace that we only dream of. We only long for, and I want you to write this down, there's two kinds of peace. There's big peace, and there's personal peace. By big peace, we mean 
the resolution of all the global conflicts and tensions and peace for the whole world and the whole universe. And by personal peace, we mean how, are you, how have you been sleeping lately? What are you stressed about? What's bringing you fear and anxiety? I don't know about you. I don't know. I, Saturday nights, you guys probably sleep great. Saturday nights are the worst night of sleep all week for me. And it's your fault. <laughs> you guys make me nervous. No, honestly, it's the responsibility of knowing I've got to get this right. I've got to present God's word accurately to you because you need it. And I want to get it right. Last night, I tossed and turned. I had the worst series of dreams. All of them were terrible. Every now and then, I dream that I got up with no notes and couldn't remember what to say, and you all laugh at me and then leave. That's terrible. Every now and then, I dream that I you know, forgot to prepare uh, or that I came up to preach and I was really prepared, but nobody came to church. There's all these recurring nightmares. About 3 a.m., I was ready to just get up and give up, just like go get coffee and wait for the sun to rise, you know. But I said, I gotta try again. You know, I'll try to go back to sleep for a few more hours because I need to have some clarity in the morning. So I toss and turn on Saturday nights. Here's the deal. No matter who you are or where you are, all of us struggle at times to have that peace that lets us sleep and rest well, that lets us live with the sense that we're not striving. You know, we're just often restless, breathless, frenetically chasing fulfillment of our souls. When Jesus comes to bring peace through his cross, he is promising eventually cosmic global peace. It's a big promise. But in the first position, he promises you peace. He wants to give you peace with God, peace of heart, peace of mind and soul. And then verse seven wraps it up and says, the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. At the end of that verse, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this, bank on it, trust God, he is going to make this happen. So my friends, dark times, desperate situations, big God, wonderful promises, credible word, huge promises that bring peace and hope and strength to your heart today. And I wanna challenge you in two ways. First of all, if you are a believer, you are in a waiting space, and I am too. Just like the people of ancient Israel, we are in between Jesus' first coming and his second coming. And knowing where we are in the biblical timeline and knowing the promise he has made that at the end of time, there is a great reckoning, there's a great judgment, there's a new heaven and a new earth, and if you have accepted his redemption, you're gonna be saved and given a new body and an eternal place in that kingdom. That's the hope that holds you when the whole world is dark. And Jesus in the interim says, you're the light. I'm in you, my spirit is in you, you're the light of the world, so go be light. Don't get mired into the darkness. Don't turn to the mystics. Hold on to my word. Hold on to my hope and be light. Be the remnant of bright people who have hope and truth. But finally, let me close by appealing to those of you who have never trusted Jesus as your Savior. I've just explained to you that 2,700 years ago, God predicted the events of the first Christmas. He predicted them at a time when they seemed absolutely, utterly impossible. And they came true precisely how he said they would. God keeps his word. He is credible, he is true, and he came for you. And if you will accept the work of Jesus on your behalf, if you'll make him your savior, he will redeem you and never, ever let you go. Jesus is our light, and this light is a gift. If you've never received this gift, I hope you will, just as we talked about in today's message. And if you have, I hope you will join me in continually, hopefully, looking up and waiting for that day, that soon coming day, when the light again will dawn. The sun will rise eternally. Thanks for joining me for part one of the Christmas Oracles. I'll see you in part two.